Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Zabor. I'm a professor of law, associate professor of law at the ANU College of Law. And on behalf of the college and the Law Reform and Social Justice Program, which is hosting this event, I'd like to welcome everyone joining us on Zoom and those listening to the podcast from around the country and hopefully from around the globe. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Sovereignty of the land and waters of Australia was never ceded. No act of the Imperial or any Australian government, let alone the act of a multinational corporation in the extractive industries can change this fact nor sever the deep spiritual, cultural, and legal connection between First Nations and this great continent. This is and always will be Aboriginal land. In acknowledging country, we must also acknowledge the deep pain and hurt that came with settler colonialism and the industries and attitudes towards the land that have accompanied it. In the aftermath of the destruction of the 46,000 year old caves in Dukan Gorge on the 24th of May this year, Putu Kuntu Kurama and Pinikura traditional owner Virtual Hayes said this, and I quote, myself, my family, our elders and our ancestors are in mourning at the desecration of our sacred site. This is a part of our land that we are deeply connected to and which was an important feature of our future. Healing is slow and painful and will not come easily. Our trust in the system and our partners has been broken completely. I hope that some good can come out of our pain as we all work to build a new future for ourselves and future generations. Now, one of the aims of this evening's panel discussion is to unpack how it is that trust in the system is so thoroughly broken and to consider to what extent the law is complicit in this fundamental breach of trust. Why is it, for instance, that both state and Commonwealth legislation notably their respective Heritage Protection Acts, but also the native title regime itself. Why is it they failed to protect a site of such profound historical, spiritual and cultural significance? How is it that the affected indigenous communities have been so completely marginalized from decision-making processes and so disempowered, locked out of both prior consultations and precluded from taking remedial action and what needs to be done, what reforms need to be instituted, what strategies adopted to prevent this occurring again before too many Dukan Gorges are destroyed. This is one of the more sobering truths to come out of 2020, that unlike the pandemic and the bushfires, Dukan Gorge is not unprecedented, it's not an anomaly. As the panel discussants will no doubt note, there have been other incidents that have been equally as catastrophic destroying invaluable heritage for the sake of a short-term payoff. They've just been less well publicized. Another question for us thus becomes whether the media focus on Jukan and what seems to me to be very real shock and grief being felt across the nation from indigenous and non-indigenous <coughs> communities alike. Can this moment be harnessed for real reform, real change? And what would that actually look like? To help answer these questions and many more, I'm joined by three national experts who will bring their own unique experiences and perspectives to the discussion. Their full CVs are available online, so I'll just try and hit some of the many highlights. Dr. Virginia Marshall is the inaugural Indigenous Postdoctoral Fellow with the ANU School of Regulation and Global Governance, REGNET, and the Fenner School of Environment and Society. She's an award-winning scholar who's written groundbreaking um, work on Aboriginal water rights and is a regular keynote speaker on Indigenous law and governance, Indigenous traditional knowledge systems, and the intersectionality of intellectual property regimes. Her current research looks at international water rights regimes to develop an Australian legal framework for Indigenous water rights. Dr. P Dr. Peter Veth is a professor of archaeology at the University of Western Australia and an honorary professor at the University of Sydney and a former colleague of mine here at the ANU from his days at the National Centre for Indigenous Studies. He currently sits on the ARC College of Experts and is a lead investigator on two ARC projects focused on Kimberley rock art and archaeology. 
He's carried out collaborative archaeological projects with traditional owners and custodians throughout the Western Desert, Kimberley, Coastal Pilbara, Northwest Shelf and Goldfields, and has worked on several cultural heritage and native title projects. He was elected Fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities in 2005 and was awarded the Rhys Jones Medal in 2014 for outstanding contributions to Australian archaeology. And if his voice sounds familiar, it may be because you heard him on the ABC just over a week ago delivering the 2020 George Seddon Memorial Lecture titled The Deep History of Place, which is a pretty relevant title for tonight's subject matter. Finally, Greg McIntyre, Senior Counsel, is a barrister practicing in Western Australia who has a long history of engagement with Indigenous legal issues. He worked with the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service of Queensland, and the Njuku Joan Legal Service in Cairns. He was engaged in the establishment of the Pijanjara Council in 1977. He had the conduct of the Mabo case from its commencement in 1982 until its conclusion in 1992, and has since had a practice in native title, racial discrimination, and Aboriginal heritage. In addition to Marbo, Greg had the conduct of other cases which have become part of the canon for us in public law, including Kuwara and Belki Peterson, and one of my favorites, Brofo and Western Australia, to name just two. He's presently engaged in litigation on behalf of the Friends of Australian Rock Art relating to the Burrup Peninsula. And to pick one of his many awards out of the hat, in 2009, he received the Australian Human Rights Commission Law Award. So it's a pretty impressive lineup. The order for proceedings for the event is at follows, uh, as follows. We're here from each panelist for up to 10 minutes and then open up for questions. As moderator, I will keep an eye on the Q&A function. So if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box so that I can bring it to the attention of the panel once they've made their initial contributions. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Virginia Marshall. Thank you. And uh, hello to everybody today. Uh, we also acknowledge country um, both the waters and the land and the richness of, of place that our elders have given to us through their excellent management of this country. Uh, and also, we're the first Australians in the timeline of Australia, which is very impressive. And also the oldest continuing culture alive today in the world. That's even more impressive. So I'm very honoured to be here for you. So I guess where I, I start also as a practicing lawyer is that um, once uh, we actually get and read the, the current uh, Aboriginal Cultural and Heritage Bill, it really is um, quite amazing uh, that it's uh, still stuck in 1972. Uh, it's really um, uh, not um, keeping up with the times, the way international laws and principles have gone forward. It's even more amazing because the type of standards that you would expect to see and the principles that you ex would expect to see that um, I've rigorously gone through with my water rights for Indigenous peoples in Australia and, and my review and research um, and also practice in the native total area of sea country uh, currently in South Australia really um, surprises me that um, governments could be expected to put such a, a very weak bill towards uh, consulting uh, Aboriginal people uh, in the belief that they would accept it. So I think that's really uh, one of the main points. And the other is that we've actually accepted in Australia and endorsed in 2009 the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in no place in a bill is there any a discussion of those principles. Uh, and there are uh, certainly a number of those articles that are quite relevant to um, ensuring that traditional owners are the primary decision maker. And that's one of the, the standouts um, in a negative sense for this particular cultural and heritage bill. Uh, in no way does it actually give Aboriginal peoples the primary decision making 
uh, and that's disconcerting. Uh, and we can see how um, the bumbling uh, outcomes of uh, Duke and Gorge has turned into tragedy um, for a range of different issues that an inquiry is looking into. But as we can see in, in this current uh, bill, there's nothing there to really support uh, traditional owners and to do what they do and what their obligations are is to manage and look after country, um, to uh, be uh, observing and obligated to continuing traditional laws and customs and practices and to have um, uh, absolute freedom to do those things. The other thing that really um, stands out to me, again, in a negative way, is much like uh, Australian water legislation in the states and territories, which means that uh, there aren't any ethical standards in this And that is also of a concern. Because ethics uh, are really important. Uh, I sit on the ANU Human Research Ethics Committee and we see um, the highest standard uh, applied to research into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia. But this document, which is, as it says in the objects of the Act, that it's actually stating to recognise and protect Aboriginal culture, but the best people to actually protect culture of this nature are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In this instance, uh, Aboriginal people who are traditional owners in Western Australia are the best people, um, not only from the knowledge um, that one possesses, but also because of the land councils and the, the significant input that you can see from uh, a number of the submissions on the Aboriginal Cultural and Heritage Bill. Uh, and another point that I'll raise too for you to think about is that the most important thing uh, in terms of consent is the absence of free, prior and informed consent in this document. Now, why is that important? Well, it's particularly important because it's not only relevant in the areas that I work in, which is intellectual property and the protection of traditional knowledge and knowledge transfer, but it's also important that free, prior and informed consent gives Aboriginal people the opportunity to have all of the information that they need to make a decision, that those decision-making processes are made within the timing of Aboriginal peoples and the way that they consult with each other and the time that they need to do those things and to be informed by all of the particulars of all of the documents, of all of the issues that are relevant to those things. And the most important thing, and, and I relate this if you've um, really gone down the road of researching and, and being bound by ethics principles, is that consent means that you should be able to have all of that information to actually agree. But if you don't agree, it means that you're able at any time to withdraw. So your consent isn't bound like it would be in a contract that you'd be signing off, sometimes with very little information. For example, in a real estate purchase, it's caveat emptor, so buyer beware. But in this instance, Aboriginal people uh, do have to have that ability to withdraw consent where, for example, uh, in the case of Duke and Gorge, if there wasn't enough information to actually enable the traditional owners to make a decision, and certainly that the minister didn't have the information to actually uh, uh, support traditional owners, um, it certainly would mean that traditional owners could stop that process. And perhaps that might even go back to going back to the informed part of that process. So I think that those issues are uh, very disappointing. And also, it's very much like uh, Australian water legislation. It's really balanced towards non-Aboriginal people. So it's really uh, looking at the extractive industries, irrigation, for example. I did a lot of research into my book now called Overturning Aquinalius that was um, published in 2017 when I won the Stanner Award and that was a wonderful prize that um, I was able to actually um, put out there for everybody to understand what was going on in water. And the whole idea is that I found that water legislation was exactly the same as Aboriginal cultural heritage. It's all balanced towards others. 
And, and that makes a mockery basically of the objects of the Aboriginal Cultural and Heritage Bill, because it's not really centred on making Aboriginal people the primary decision makers and the holders of that knowledge. It's really making them much less, it's, it's much like uh, native title and the way it operates, that we have to submit to all other laws as native title holders. And it, it's a creature of the common law, one would say. But what it is, is, is it's much like sui generis, and I'm not a fan of sui generis because it really limits Aboriginal peoples to a right to take. It's a very weak, even though it's part of international practice, it's a very weak law to actually comply, uh, and I mean governments to comply with, and certainly proponents to comply with. And over the years, I've been an Indigenous stakeholder on sites, and my uh, difficulty has always been when people say, well, we're going to look through all of this different uh, area of land or waters, the artefacts that you might find, the sites that you might find, but at the end of the day, the sign off coming in days or months is a consent to destroy. And that is not acceptable because clearly some places should never be destroyed. Um, if we were going to put a consent to destroy in the opera house or the museums that you've come to know and love, um, the end of those things would be the end of, of part of our, our understanding of humanity. And that's what Duke and Gorge is. It's the destruction of humanity and also the knowledge of this place um, and as it as it represents you know near the time of the ice age um, and another area that's uh, also in that category is the mooning peoples in the south australian bite um, and the submerged lands that's recognized to be over fifty thousand years old so you know we've got to honor and protect those sites and it's very important to have those standards as i said and the other thing is to the language of the bill I've found this very similar in uh, Australian water legislation where it's very passive where it talks to Aboriginal people and what rights we have. So the passage lang uh, language in here is uh, whatever is, is practicable to include Aboriginal people, whether it's ancestral remains and, and their uh, undertaking or their conduct or their receipt of ancestral remains. So there's very passive language in that uh, particular bill. So that concerns me. And the other thing um, that concerns me is the structure of the Aboriginal um, Cultural Heritage Council. Um, the council itself is, is built on a very weak structure, which is um, the minister uh, making all the decisions. Um, the chairperson is Aboriginal. Uh, however, uh, every other person that actually sits on that council is non-Aboriginal uh, and can be non-Aboriginal. And also, I think that if people are going to have insight into Aboriginal traditional laws and customs, um, quite honestly, they need to be traditional owners. And they need to be sitting around on that committee um, making those decisions. Uh, and certainly, in the directions of the minister under this uh, particular bill is concerning. <clears throat> because if the minister decides that he wants to have certain information and he um, shouldn't not have that information according to the Aboriginal people of the, the area concerned. Um, how can we honour that direction uh, when, for example, there might be uh, law and custom and business attached to that, whether it's women's business or men's business? So in other words, Aboriginal people are not in control under this particular model and this cultural heritage bill. And also the penalties, the penalties are obscene. Uh, and I don't mean that they're uh, extremely high penalties, uh, they're very low penalties. Uh, I, I find that those penalties for the destructions of sites um, need to also attract compensation. There isn't compensation uh, up front in the, in the bill. And that um, in, in relation to uh, the Griffiths case, Timber Creek, um, means that there should be a recognition of compensation. And if that goes into the billions for Duke and Gorge, well, so be it. Um, that's the way we need to um, ensure that these things don't happen on a regular basis. As I said, most of the places that you actually um, reside on, you rent, um, that you actually go to visit certain places in restaurants, for example, have been built on Aboriginal sites, uh, have built on Aboriginal uh, sites of, in water areas. And many of those sites um, have had massacre areas um, attached to those or very significant places. 
Um, we've got a range of developments happening around us today, uh, which is extremely sad because all of those significant artefacts uh, that I mentioned to Peter about trachyte, trachyte and also camp ovens and um, significant uh, artefact finds are going to be reburied on site, never to be seen again, apart from in a report on a shelf. And many of the people living in those suburbs and towns and rural communities will never get to see or understand that there were significant um, um, uh, um, populations of Aboriginal people across the country. Uh, and that remains hidden. Um, bush foods and Aboriginal medicines and our landscapes, according to Bill Gamage's book on, on the, the, the greatest uh, and the most incredible land management of Aboriginal people um, has occurred, but um, we're wiping it out and we're wiping and erasing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's um, knowledge and also um, their very being, their very identity, because that's what Aboriginal cultural heritage is all about. It's our identity as a people. And I think that that's really important to understand. The other thing is that I'd, I'd really, um, uh, that's really taken me uh, uh, quite um, aback, which is uh, my preparation for the Universal Periodic Review and the submissions that I made with my colleagues last week for the Indigenous Peoples Organisation. Um, that a lot of those uh, subject areas were on Duke and Gorge and native title and climate change, etc. And we uh, were uh, really presenting those towards a range of embassies and, um, and nation states and NGOs. And the most important thing that um, we look at is our recommendations. And I'll just read through this one, which is the recommendation that we put up the other week, which is the Australian Government Review and Amend the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protect Act 1984 and the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 to confer free, prior and informed consent for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. And the other one was a recommendation that the Australian government ensure that all sacred items removed from Duke and Gorge by Rio Tinto be returned to the traditional owners and the traditional owners be funded to establish an appropriate keeping place. Now, there are only two recommendations and because we have to limit our time, there's a very, very small amount of time that we're, we're provided with to actually put those up. But I would ask everyone to support those recommendations. And if there are any international um, nation state representatives to really support those recommendations, because this is uh, an issue that we actually share across the uh, nations. Um, I see uh, regularly on the website that there are artifacts for sale and, and that's broad reaching. That's Maori, um, Canadian uh, and Aboriginal Australian artefacts and and that's also covered in the Aboriginal uh, Cultural Heritage Bill. However, there is nothing that happens about those sales and many of them have been rainmaker stones and Peter would know that they're very significant um, on sale online um, in very strange uh, and obscure um, parts of that that whole dark web as well. So my concern is that um, a lot of the responsibility for the outcome of this is really um, not resting with the traditional owners, who it should be. Um, they should be um, the primary decision makers. They should be front and centre of, of the bill. They need to be able to express and be supported to do what they do. Um, and that's the most important thing. And also for um, community members to also support traditional owners. And there are many people across Australia who quite willingly would be happy to support traditional owner groups. I had a, an email the other day to, from the Jaja Wurong people in um, Victoria, who were very upset about uh, trees going to be cut down, 800 year old trees and a couple of birthing trees that remain, but many other trees didn't. And my heart goes out to them because the failure in the Commonwealth emergency orders to stop uh, and desist was so weak. And, and the minister again, Susan Lee, failed uh, to um, give Aboriginal peoples any hope that those emergency orders that are actually effective, uh, and they weren't in this situation. What had happened is that um, they saw the trees the next day after the restrictions were lifted in Melbourne, and those trees were left in the back of a truck, cut up. So if you think of that tree as 
somebody that you love. That's exactly how Aboriginal people feel when their site is destroyed. Um, Duke and Gorge, for example, or the Jojo Wurrung people. Um, there is no harm, harmony in the laws and um, certainly across Australia, there's no insight of governments generally on how important this is, not only internationally, but for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This is significant. We, we're actually just burning our libraries. That's what we're doing. We're burning our libraries. And, and we need really to take heed that we need to change this. And we don't support the Aboriginal and Cultural Heritage Bill. Um, and we look at different ways of really incorporating human rights um, and also those international principles that I talked about. And intellectual property, again, is not covered in this bill. And it needs to be. Because every part of this that I deal with in intellectual property and traditional knowledge it is important. It needs to be covered. And this needs also to bring it to your attention that you're not powerless. Uh, remember, Bryce Courtney wrote The Power of One. And one person can make a difference. And I really believe that. Thank you. Mandangul. Thank you, Virginia. I'm going to hand straight over to um, to Peter. Thanks very much, uh, Matthew. And I also acknowledge that I'm on ancestral grounds here in Fremantle, Perth, Noongar Wajuk lands, and pay my respects to elders, traditional owners, past, present, and emerging, and also for the other areas we're talking about today. Uh, thanks, Virginia, for that incredibly um, powerful statement around uh, indigenous values and association to place. One of the things that has really um, impacted on me with Jukun, in addition to the tragedy of the loss to the Pudukundikurama Pinagora people, is the fact that they have actually said this is of loss to them, but also to national heritage and to global heritage. And that really draws attention back to the UN DRIP and those national standards and instruments which aren't recognised or linked into the current bill. So we know from 2003 to 2013, there was consultation of sorts and archaeology and other values established around the Jukun Gorges. The Section 18, which is a consent to use land on which a site occurs, was granted in 2013 and it was subject to uh, the Minister's conditions, which was to do so-called mitigation. And that is to get a lot more information about the site. And that wouldn't be just its history, it wouldn't be just its ethnographic value. It wouldn't be just material culture. It would be the values of the place. Because if we're not talking about the values of specific Indigenous heritage and what it means to those first Australians, and in a broader sense, what are we doing? We're commoditizing it and turning it into another state chattel. So the mitigation was done. And as most people would be aware from the media, there were over 7,000 artefacts recovered, a chronology of at least 46,000 years old, and something I'm acutely aware of as an arid zone archaeologist was a, a unique record through the last ice age. And here we're talking around 30, 25,000 years ago to 18, where conditions were really quite different in Northwest Australia. And Aboriginal people obviously continued to use and enjoy and celebrate the site of Jukun and the surrounds. And so there are artefacts through that period and back to 46,000 years. There are artefacts, including a hair belt fragment with DNA linking um, the site to contemporary people. And so it's really clear that there were increasing values. Those values were being known by the PKKP, by their heritage um, advisors, and by the consultants and others doing this work. And, and those values escalated. There was clearly um, some kind of lack of tracking of the status or safety of the site. And when there was going to be a threat, a potentially um, destructive and final threat to the site, um, you know, a call was made against the ATSIP Act, 1984. And as Virginia said, um, that really should have been an intervention by the federal government. Um, that act does allow mediation. It does create effectively a stop work order. And although the current federal government and state 
have to usually be different for it to be an intervention. Um, it's there. And so this brings us back to the fundamental issue. Um, can we rely on state legislation which gives variable centrality and not a caveat to Indigenous people, or do we need some kind of fallback or federal instrument? And that must go back to issues of national standards, the UN DRIP, and a range of other um, related issues. When I um, did a summary recently of the history of the WA Aboriginal Heritage Act, it's like a, a sinuous diagram showing about 20 or 30 different phases where there were previous impacts, as Matthew said, Marindu, a site of great significance, destroyed. Yakabindi, Kalamili, Swan Brewery, uh, P Hill and the Kimberley, in fact, the genesis of the Kimberley Land Council in 1978. These have been major heritage crises where the state legislation was found not to protect and not to provide a mediation or compensate or any kind of other mechanism that certainly didn't um, protect the heritage values. So it's not breaking news that there needs to be reform to this Act. Clive Senior has been commissioned twice in 1991 and 96 to write detailed submissions on what a reformed Act could have. And as long as 30 years ago, he said it should have um, a heritage tribunal that should give greater centrality to Aboriginal people, a whole range of mechanisms that are uh, totally consistent and in fact, risky in the greatest sense not to carry out. So, we have really seen the end of a long, a conflicted, and obviously a non-native title recognising um, heritage regime end now in this tragedy. And so I think we're in a critical point of recognition of Indigenous primacy and heritage in this country, but we're also in an extremely important phase of industry development. It, it is estimated that some of these iron ore footprints in the Pilbara will increase a hundredfold in the next hundred years. Those are discoverable plans from at least one company. Now, if that's the case, there will be almost certainly erosion and impacts on cultural heritage and a whole range of other values. And although we've seen this in the EPA, we haven't actually seen a full discussion of protecting cultural landscapes. In other words, you don't protect sites in isolation. If there is a social or cultural landscape with a range of values, you would surely have that in some kind of protected conservation um, offset or estate or area that's not used. And then presumably other areas that might be used with free, prior and informed consent. But that entire move towards modern uh, regulation of cumulative impacts and here on cultural heritage on centrality of the native title and host groups and the decision making and obviously in the benefits is, is at stake. I don't think we'll ever be at such a critical period in the history probably of this country. And so we do have to think seriously and talk about, as Virginia said in the IPO recommendations, keeping places, serious knowledge centres and keeping places on country. Ranger programs, there are IPA and other ranger programs around the state in Australia, but still very few in the Pilbara because it's so heavily regulated with the mining tenements and safety. But this surely has to be rangers looking after country, maintaining sites, curating those values, looking at issues around the fabric and the material cultural assets. If that had been in place, then presumably Jukin would have been much harder to have happen. So that is making the legislation live. It puts it into some kind of effect. I can say briefly that the new bill does have some advances and it, it does. Um, it's got stop work orders. It gives regionalism for the local area cultural heritage services. The section 18 is gone. There are new penalty structures, but it clearly uh, doesn't go far enough. It clearly doesn't um, address some of the things and others that Virginia has mentioned around um, caveats and rights of veto or final say. And one of the things that we as heritage um, researchers feel very strongly about is that if the local area heritage services, cultural heritage services, who may be native title bodies or others, are not funded, they're not provisioned, if there isn't this the skill and capacity building, then the burden of compliance will be handballed from the regulator, from the ministry, through from the ACMC to the regions, and the regions will be expected to do this as a duty of care 
And yet the actual funding for this will be presumably largely, if not completely reliant on funding from the client or the proponent. And so there's a material conflict of interest there. So you'd need a much more independent and robust system for those local area heritage services to work. The other issue is the Aboriginal Heritage Council, the review body uh, appointed by the minister may have Aboriginal people from all the regions, but it's not representative by nature. And that seems like a very obvious thing to do, to make it representative to have those different nations, Yamaji, Kimberley, Noongar and so forth, represented on that committee. And for there to be some kind of independence where if values or matters are disagreed on, then that there can be something beyond the SAC, which is not just procedural. There has to be some kind of discussion of the actual content of the heritage and the risk and the loss in the way that Virginia has outlined. So the AACA and other bodies I've been involved in have wrote many detailed submissions. Uh, there have been 157 to the last um, amendments to the bill and about 62% found there were major issues. So this is not a vexatious claim. The majority of people who I think are fair and reasonable, including industry, still see considerable risk in a poorly formulated bill. So it does have to have objectives which talk about care and conservation. The local heritage services do have to be sufficiently funded. The definitions, cultural terms, significance and values are not there, so it's opaque. They might be there with the regulations, but surely they can be in at this stage and use some of those national terms. Protected areas would receive very high protection, but they're actually reliant on the minister recommending an area go up as a PA. If the minister decides not to, it's, it, there's absolutely nothing that can be done. It can't be challenged. And, and there are further and other issues so what I might say in conclusion is that I think it's really an important time in the management of heritage and recognition of First Australians' rights to protect heritage beyond compliance. Compliance is a given. That should just be part of the normal framework. There must be more, more investment, more recognition. In France, 1% um, of funds in major projects go to cultural heritage. They have a major several hundred million dollar fund. Uh, why can't that happen here? Uh, in WA, the compliance budget last year was $4 million, but the resources income is $172 billion. So, you know, there's no symmetry here. That's, that's not right. Um, there should be a range of programs. There should be keeping places, and there should be a recognition that these cultural landscapes are assets, and this should be written into the codes. So I think I'll um, leave it there for the moment. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Peter, for taking us through that. Um, and finally, Greg, and can I just remind everyone that the, the, the Q&A function is open, so please do pop your questions in there. We only have one at the moment, so there's, there's plenty of space. Kaya, yon karich nyolok nyonin, wajak nunga buja, yon burunin klub karich danya, kora yaya buruan, kaya. I, I'm thankful to Professor Len Collard for teaching me how to make an acknowledgement in co to country, to Wajak Noongar country in the Noongar language and to pay my respects in the Noongar language to the to elders, um, past, present and aspiring. The destruction of Jukun Gorge was not the first time that Rio Tinto blew up such a cave. A dozen years ago, Rio Tinto announced that they were going to blow up a similar cave within their same mining area in the Pilbara. Um, they did have uh, archaeologists come in and, and collect some artefacts before they did that. Uh, and we took Justice French, as he then was as a member of the federal court, um, to go and visit the cave uh, and the men sang the secret men's songs, the importance of that site um, and informed the court and, and effectively the loss of that site was mourned in advance that it had been blowing up, blown up to reveal the $10 billion worth of iron ore, which we were told by Rio Tinto 
$10 million of iron ore, which was underneath that cave. We have moved along, at least now when this happens, it's a matter of some national significance. It didn't raise to the level of national significance a dozen years ago, so I suppose one could say that we've made some small step of progress that now ordinary people in the street actually think that it's the wrong thing to do to blow up ancient culture of our nation. It's taken us a while to get to this point. Um, there's now something of a catch up happening with the announcement of the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill by the state of Western Australia to try and improve a piece of legislation which Virginia and Peter have pointed out has been in existence since 1972, which effectively is a, has been a process for licensing the destruction of Aboriginal heritage. The, the current bill does not have any necessary Indigenous input into the process. Uh, there's nothing in the legislation which requires any person advising the minister to be Indigenous. Uh, the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Committee uh, suggests that the minister might select some people who know something about what they're advising him about, uh, but it's not a, a requirement. There's a provision which says that there should be a person with uh, archaeological or anthropological or ethnographic expertise on the committee. Uh, but in reality, there hasn't been such a person for, for the last several years. Uh, and there's a provision in the legislation which allows for decisions to be made without that section being complied with. We know that in relation to the Jook and Gorge decision, there was a bare quorum of four members of the committee, one of whom was, was Indigenous. The other three were ex officio government appointed officials. Uh, and clearly they, had, they knew very little about what they were making the decision about. Uh, they don't seem to have had any information about the important work, archaeological work which had been done on the site. Uh, and, and consent was given really without knowledge of the significance of the site, it, it appears. Uh, that's how the state legislation is working at present. Uh, we know that we went through a phase of the department recommending to the Culture and Materials Committee to remove hundreds of sites from the register. We had to go to court to get the Supreme Court, in the case of Robinson and Fielding, declare that, that a sacred site is a site for the purposes of the Aboriginal Heritage Act. It doesn't have to have, been, have had some ritual or ceremonial activity associated with it to be protected by this current piece of legislation, uh, as the guidelines of the department suggested. Uh, the department had, through the Cultural Materials Committee, advised the removal of hundreds of, hundreds of sites, particularly water-related sites, which are some of the, the most significant sites for Aboriginal people across the nation. Uh, we managed, in that case of Robinson and Fielding, to establish that the, the waters of Port Hedland created by the, the serpent, uh, who was a, a common creation figure in indigenous culture, had created a whole of that water, and that that was a site of, of sacred significance. Um, I think they're still playing catch up to relist sites on the register that they had removed since that time. The current piece of legislation proposed by the West Australian government is an improvement, as Peter said, on what we had before. We, we, didn't, we don't have under the current legislation anything like a stop order of the kind which does exist in the federal, under the federal legislation. There's a proposal in this bill that there, there is a provision for stop orders uh, there, are also, there are also provisions which respond to what happened at Jook and Gorge, 
because what the minister told us and, and what I see the Registrar of Sites was telling the Standing Committee on Northern Australia this week is that once a Section 18 decision had been made to consent to the destruction of that site, there was no capacity for the minister to turn it back or reverse that decision. There's nothing in the current legislation which would allow that. At least that has been recognised in the current proposed form of the bill where new information arrives, uh, then the minister can take that into account. Uh, in the submission that I've made on behalf of various people, I think the provision still needs some tinkering with uh, to actually say what they thought it meant. I don't think it quite reads that way, but there, it, it's, a, it's a good attempt. The, this current bill is much um, thicker than, the, than, the, than the, the current legislation and it has a lot more, lot more processes in it. I'm concerned that it, it um, may blind us uh, with science by creating more processes but ultimately ending up with much the same result. In, what it does is to separate um, what we had under the past bill of an offence, past piece of legislation, or the existing piece of legislation, I should say, of an offence for excavation, damage, destruction, concealment, or alteration. We now have a three tiered approach where, we, where they talk about serious harm, material harm, and low in, and um, harm, which is neither of those. So it, it seems as though it's a trivial or negligible harm. And then you have three processes. So for low impact activities, there are permits able to be issued uh, on the recommendation of the committee. There's, there are then these Aboriginal cultural heritage management plans, which are proposed to be either by agreement or by approval. Now, it seems to me that there's a, there's a very strange optimism that Aboriginal people are actually going to agree to medium and, and high impact activities affecting their sites. And that, that's what the Act suggests these management plans are going to be. They're going to be agreed that, well, they will only apply where, to medium and high impact activities. Uh, and then the question comes whether Aboriginal, the, the local uh, people who will, under this present legislation, be able to form into local committees uh, and provide their, their views on it, which is something of an improvement on the current legislation. They will then, if they're going to agree to a plan, agree to medium to high impact activities affecting their sites. Well, I, there are no Aboriginal people I know who are likely to agree to such things. So what will be, it will become the fallback position, which then allows the minister to approve these management plans where no agreement has been reached. And so that's really the, the, that'll be the new equivalent of the section 18 ministerial consent, where the minister will override what the average, what the local uh, knowledge holders uh, would be prepared to agree to and approve low impact, low to high impact activity destroying sites. Uh, I'm not sure that we've actually gone any too many steps for in, in advance of where we are under the current legislation uh, with these kinds of provisions. Um, the, the, minister, the current minister, um, who's the amateur man himself, um, put some store by the, the idea that agreements have been entered into under the Native Title Act. And some of those agreements, this legislation would suggest can be um, wheeled into the, this new bill. But of course, most of those agreements are agreements of the kind which the PKKP had with Rio Tinto, which had that what some call the non-derogation clause where they were prohibited from even informing the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Committee that a site was going to be affected. Uh, and 
as you know, the the Bundjama people uh, in the wake of this um, got a message through their archaeologist, I think it was, to the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Committee in breach of the clause which was in their similar agreement uh, informing the Cultural Materials Committee that BHP were proposing to damage uh, dozens of sites. We now know that BHP, when that became public, backed off from that position and said they would have further discussions with the Bunjama people. I, think, I see as late as this week that Rio Tinto are said to have now said they won't enforce the non-derogation clauses in their various agreements or have, have perhaps negotiated amendments to them. I'm not quite sure of how they're dealing with that. Um, but that's the situation we're in. The federal legislation doesn't help us much. Um, we know the history of that legislation, even though there are stock orders effectively. They've very rarely been used. Um, I can only think of a handful of cases where that's actually occurred. We had to go to the federal court in relation to the Swan Brewery development, which Peter, I think, mentioned to, in, to get a declaration that the minister, Mr. Tickner at the time, had not complied with the legislation in declining to make an order under section 10 of that piece of legislation. Um, we know in the, the Juk and Gorge case, um, the Putakunti Kurana and Benakura people through their lawyers went to Ken Wyatt, the Federal Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, asking for some intervention by the federal government. It's reported that he suggested an interlocutory injunction, but it, these, what I don't, I'm not sure they realised the PKKP at the time was that it's not his responsibility. It happens to be the responsibility of Susan Lee, who's the Minister for the Environment. Uh, so they never, I don't think they ever quite got to Susan Lee in the exigency of the time. Uh, they did contemplate injunctive relief, but it seems that they were told by Rio Tinto that it was too late. The charges had already been laid uh, and it couldn't be stopped. That seems not to have been entirely accurate as I read the, the publicity on the topic. Um, what one would hope is that the fact that these things are being discussed so thoroughly in this year is that our nation will rise to the occasion of understanding that the heritage we have in Australia, which is 40,000 plus years old, some of it I hear archaeologists such as Peter now finding things which date back 60,000 years. We need to rise to the occasion and, and understand that that is an important part of our culture. It is more important than billions of dollars worth of iron ore uh, being extracted by companies which are essentially overseas companies. Um, and redress the balance, create some balance between the importance of the heritage of Australia uh, with the short-term economic gain to resource companies. I'll leave it at that, Matthew. Thank you, Greg. That was... um. A, a very sort of sobering overview of the failure of the law um, and its complicity, the Native Title Act, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act at the federal level. Um, we have had a, a couple of questions about that. I'm glad that you you ended on a, uh, a somewhat optimistic note about our, our nation rising to the challenge. And I think that takes us to the first couple of questions that we have here, um, which I'm gonna lump together. Um, Lois Wishart Lindsay says, since hundreds if not thousands of sacred sites have been obliterated by mining in the Pilbara to date, 
why do you think this Jukang Gorge rock shelters case has struck such a chord with the public nationally and internationally? Is it because of the archaeology revealing 46,000 years of human occupation, um, given broadening appreciation of deep time in Australia? Do people also appreciate the impact of sacred sites, song lines and country destruction on First Nations peoples? Does this represent ongoing colonial dispossession in the name of economic growth? And um, Mary Spears Williams um, asks a similar, I think, related question um, as to whether there is a show, social shift. Are governments pushing back against corporations and recognizing the importance of First Peoples custodianship? Social media news about corporate reactions against Rio Tinto suggests that there is some sort of shift in attitudes about protecting, respecting country, even handing over real control to custodians, etc. But what Peter especially, especially shared um, suggests that this is a veil to allow extractive industries, etc., to continue as usual. So, can we hope for real change? I think a couple of those questions, Peter, really go to um, to what you were talking about. So I want to start with you, especially this idea of deep time, which was uh, mentioned by Lois. Um, thanks, Matthew, and, and thanks to um, the two questions. Look, I think this is a really important issue, and I suspect that it's multi-causal. I think Jukan became potent internationally because it was deep time. It was an antiquity that people generally in Australia don't think about or talk about. And without it being a competition, this is before modern people get to Europe, so it is globally unique. Um, I think during the time of COVID, there was more discussion about values and heritage. Um, I think the optics of intact cathedral-like caves being blown up did actually trigger um, strong sentiments. One of my Indigenous colleagues from the Pilbara said if it was just an ethnographic site, there wouldn't have been as much reaction. And that's possibly true, but this is a clear case of profound antiquity, continuity, and ethnographic or contemporary connections. And so I think all of those things were, were triggered and those values were recognised. And I think there also has to be very significant credit given to the Indigenous leadership um, who are talking and obviously positioning a voice uh, for constitutional recognition. And so these issues, the heritage, the, the received landscape um, is being made absolutely critical now, virtually daily in different media. And so I think people are thinking about that in new ways. I think this is an aggregate um, point in time. And I know that when the news of this destruction came out, there were people in Kalgoorlie, Rockhampton, the Gulf, uh, both Indigenous and non, who were shocked. And so there has been a change in the national consciousness. And I think like uh, Greg and Virginia said towards the end, um, this is potentially a major revolution in the way Australians actually recognise um, this deep sense of place of the Australian First Nations continent. Can I just add that? Thanks, Peter. I think the most important thing to remember is um, when, when I spoke on Black Lives Matter this year, um, there were a couple of seminars that I gave, and when you try and think that um, Australians really had to understand that black deaths in custody has been an issue since this place was invaded in 1788. And why was it, and this was a question I asked myself, why was it that the incident with George, George Floyd in America triggered incredible protests across the world? It's a phenomenon and, and, and it's not unique. It's, it's a phenomenon that's happening on a regular basis in the Aboriginal communities. And I think it's somewhere in there to the explanation of Duke and Gorge uh, that people um, realise when they read the newspaper and there's so many um, people in New South Wales, Western Australia, you had Miss Do who died after a couple of days being held in a police cell. Um, you've got other um, uh, Aboriginal people that were uh, held in holding cells, in watchtowers, youth detention. We've had Dondale, the horrific pictures of um, Dylan Boller being covered with his head 
um, uh, and um, where he was pinned down into um, a, a, a chair, um, looking dehumanised and, and helpless and vulnerable. Those are the pictures that are in our, our minds because of the news. And I think that um, it takes sometimes one of those incidents, um, and we can't explain it really, uh, and it just triggers people's um, uh, ability to be compassionate and to actually understand that they're talking about human beings, um, not primitive people, uh, not people who are inferior by any means, however inferior the, the legislation is and the treatment of Indigenous peoples in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, I think that that's what it is. And I think because of COVID, we've had time to reevaluate our own relationships um, and our primary relationships with partners and siblings and children and that deep insight has really um, uh, made a difference to a lot of Australians. They've had actually time to stop and time to listen to the news where people are so busy and rushing. And, you know, it's like um, both of us, Greg and, and myself, going to court, you know, and you've got actions and you've got times you've got to do in reports and, and a whole range of different things, plus all of the other work, the academic scholarship and whatnot. And, and your normally family life of just being responsible for certain things outside of your work. So I explain it that way. I think that's what it is. And that situation mightn't happen again in the near future because all of those things have actually have to come together. You know, it's like the meeting of the, the minds and, and the aligning of the planets, I guess, to you know, use that analogy. And, and that's what I think this, this year was about with Duke and Gorge. Uh, whether that momentum um, stays next year because there will be other incidents that happen like this. Um, we need to be prepared and we need, need to come together um, in, in calling out uh, really badly drafted legislation and also legislation that is going to impair Aboriginal people's uh, ability to be and to act as traditional owners. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. And I think constitutional recognition, I think Mary has raised, it's, it's, that's a total failure. And it's a failure for one reason, and I've written about this as well, is that you know, the, the states and territories have recognised um, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution, but it doesn't have legal effect. There is nothing that flows from that recognition because the governments themselves have ensured that there is nothing that flows. And that's what we're talking about with constitutional recognition. So unless we actually get our heads around how, how important, how valuable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture is every day of our lives. Um, and a, a consent to destroy is not, is not, not normalised as a fait accompli. And that's, that's my wish. That's my understanding for people really not to see it as acceptable for those consent to destroyers because it, it breaks our heart um, around us. Um, this week we've seen a lot of artefacts that have been rediscovered, but they will be um, either underneath a building, um, uh, they'll, be, they'll be lost from the consciousness of the people that really live in these areas. And, and that is a tragedy. Thank you. Matthew, I, if I can add my answer. The, I think our society has changed, is changing. I mean, one of the thing, ways in which it is changing is with social media. And as I said, something very similar happened a dozen years ago. It did get some press. I mean, I remember um, uh, Bunjima, Senior Bunjima Man appearing in the Dutch news uh, about the fact that, his, that this site had been destroyed. It still didn't gain traction within the Australian community. Mm. I think where it, what is helping it to gain traction, I mean, social media has its has its negatives as well. Uh, but it, it means that ordinary people get to know about, get to express their feelings. And, and we saw shareholders of Rio Tinto banding together and telling Rio Tinto that they do not want them behaving in this way. Now that was more difficult to do a decade ago. Uh, I think it, it is, it's indicative of a social change, which hopefully will prevail.
hopefully it'll prevail in a positive way. As I say, we also see some very negative consequences of social media, but this I think is one of the more positive ones. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, I think the, um, uh, the shareholder revolt, so to speak, was quite inspiring for us all to witness. That there have been some questions on the, um, in the question and answer box about Rio itself, because I, I know we can feel somewhat optimistic about what we've witnessed in terms of a seeming cultural shift, attitudinal shift in the, um, amongst the Australian public, but the extractive industry is still very powerful and very active. I think, Peter, you mentioned the next 100 years, um, we're just going to see a ramping up um, of, uh, of us um, uh, looking for resources within our um, th this great land. So I'm just going to choose a few of these questions. Uh, Geta Forti asks, developers usually appoint and pay a cultural assessor. I think this kind of came up in one of the presentations. What can be done about this conflict of interests? They um, Obviously, we rely on the assessments being made by the industry. Um, Mia Stone asks, noting the weakness of the legislation, are there any current creative options to hold Rio Tinto accountable other than public shaming or the um, shareholder um, revolt? Um, and Kate Fitch asked, what was the role of Rio Tinto's corporate affairs team? So I think all of these really go to well, what's happening within that industry at the moment. They must be meeting 24 seven to try and strategize how to address the cultural shift that we've just identified being so significant that might impair their, their business model. Um, so I don't know if any of you have any, any views on that. Uh, I, I would just say um, that we are looking at burgeoning land access. Um, there are hundreds of new tenements throughout the Western Desert. There are obviously fracking and other kinds of interests in the Kimberley. And so this is not going to go away as a management or a legal or a um, heritage management issue. Um, with respect to the question of developers appointing cultural assessors, it's true, some do. Sometimes native title parties appoint them, sometimes they're appointed by third parties. We would like to think in a fair and reasonable world that they would be independent, like an expert witness providing evidence in a court proceeding. Um, it should be to the value of the heritage. And all of us who have been around this area for quite a long time know that um, it's not easy to put in negative recommendations, but we've done it. And that's really the test of the probity or the independence of the system where you can actually say, this is a bad idea, this proposal doesn't work, there is unnatural risk here. So I think that's, that is an issue that the professional bodies and the um, land council and native title bodies have been acutely aware of. There are regulations and there have been serious codes of ethics put in place, but they can never be vigilant enough. But I think it, they will be all revisited at the moment because of these issues. In terms of creative options, I'd just like to say briefly, I think it'd be great, not, not to speak on behalf of PKHP or anyone else, but I think it'd be you know, really important to see a significant reinvestment in heritage beyond compliance, and whether that's keeping places, interpretive centres, a range of programs and so forth. I still think the reinvestment um, component, quantum, beyond compliance is not as high as it should be. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think I just add on to that quickly. I think that we, we're talking about uh, Australians just in this context, really having an understanding of what we're talking about is really important. Um, not only an improvement, a, a vastly improved bill, but also that culture, Aboriginal culture and Torres Strait Islander culture is valued. And one example that I'll give is that when I taught the College of Law, uh, Indigenous Peoples in the Law, uh, it was really interesting because most of uh, the students had said that they felt ripped off was basically um, one word that came through regularly, that they hadn't had um, an understanding of Aboriginal people, clearly a, a very um, uh, unique and, 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 and deep understanding of Aboriginal people, uh, when they went to primary school or high school and when they came to university and they were going to their fourth and fifth year, they had still very little understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So 
I guess what I'm saying here is that unless Australians have that understanding, that deep understanding of value of Aboriginal heritage or Torres Strait Islander heritage, um, people then that take on positions such as uh, Rio Tinto or other um, connective industries, irrigation for water, for example, if, the, if they're not in there and aware and have that knowledge, their decision-making is going to be flawed. So I think that that's one thing that we still struggle with um, is, you know, when we go to court, I'd ask Greg, you know, how many judges does he appear uh, before that are other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Um, how many solicitors are there at the bar table? Um, how many barristers who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are appearing um, next to you um, at, at, the, at the bar table again? So I know when I go into Sydney, there are very few people that I see and um, from month to month. Um, so, and certainly not on the bench uh, as an Aboriginal person or Torres Strait Islander person and very limited um, uh, as far as barristers go. So I think that, you know, in all of the professions, we have to have people who are not only from our community, but also are really quite aware of uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history from this country. I think we understand more about African-American culture and, 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 um, and Af you know, really the law from a lot of these series that come, uh, Law and Order, for example, and you know, all of the other English shows that are about law and order. I think that there's more of an understanding of those things uh, and pop culture than there is about the true and unique and deep history of Australia. There are a few comments I can make. I mean, we, we did have our first um, Indigenous judge appointed in Western Australia this year. I saw that, yeah. But uh, obviously he's in a very small minority and, and there's a small handful of, of Indigenous lawyers around the country. The, um, on the topic of, of consultants, one of the things which this proposed bill in Western Australia does or shadow is, is some guidelines which set a code of conduct and a requirement for registration of those consultants who are giving advice uh, and, make, and assisting with heritage assessment. So that, that didn't exist, doesn't exist under the current legislation. Uh, if it comes into fruition, then that's an improvement. Uh, and on one of the other topics which was raised about Rio Tinto and how they, um, their corporate relations uh, operated, it seems they, they, have, they have community relations officers whose part of whose job is to interact with uh, traditional owners on the ground where they're operating. I mean, most of the agreements that I've ever negotiated have clauses which set up liaison committees, uh, which in my experience seem to rarely meet. Uh, and I mean, I've, the experience I've had with the Bunjima, and it seems to be that it's, it's replicated with their next door neighbours, the, the PKKP, is that when they negotiated those agreements, uh, there was a team of community relations people in the companies who put in the time, signed off on the agreement, and then slowly moved out of the company and were replaced by others who didn't know the, the history of it and the relationship deteriorated. Uh, and I think Rio have, have progressively recognized that they dropped the ball, uh, that they didn't have a, an ongoing relationship with the PKKP, which ought to have have alerted them to, to what they were about to do. Um, and that, that flags uh, a, a breakdown in, 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 the, in a corporate culture which purports to be a good neighbour culture or to, to operate according to a social licence. I think one of the things maybe they have learnt from this experience is that if they're going to maintain their social license, then they, they have to maintain their community relations and have to be properly informed so as to avoid making such terrible mistakes again. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'm looking at the time. Um, I realise there was some confusion as to when this would um, actually finish. Uh, but I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll take one more question. Um, 
and it leads directly from what Greg was just talking about. And I apologize to those of you who asked such fabulous questions and we haven't been able to get to them. There's, there's 23 on there. I will copy them and send them to the participants so that your voice is heard, even if it's not in this particular um, more public forum. Um, Roger Burrett, though, posted something quite early on, and it goes to what you were just talking about, Greg, with social licenses. Um, I agree with Greg that the need is for a social license to operate in areas with Aboriginal heritage rather than a legal license to destroy, I think goes to this sort of um, shifting of paradigms, really. How can the ethical aspects of the social license effectively be improved to move beyond compliance with legislation by corporations and their leaders? Is management of the relative risk of harm the best that we have? Or should we introduce absolute powers where critical sites are recognized and would never be destroyed? I might throw that open to the whole panel to see if anyone wants to, to pick up on it as the final question. I'll just have a quick response. I, I'll still go back to what we've all talked about as free prior and informed consent. So I think that's really important to have in any Aboriginal cultural heritage bill or that of the Torres Strait Islands. I think that's essential. And I think it's essential that we have UNDRIP and we also have um, international law and standards as we've had some of those in uh, a schedule in the water legislation, for example, with Ramsar and, and other migratory birds and the um, acknowledgement of, of conventions. I think we really have to move um, into that um, sphere where any bill like this really regulates clearly um, as a good international citizen. So I think it also goes to the question that was raised. I think it's very important to see the benefit of, of corporate social responsibility uh, and, I, and also all to be creative in those outcomes I think is really important and I think we need to talk more deeply with traditional owners on these issues. I think traditional owners really um, are spending so much time trying to work against um, the negative outcomes of these um, proposed provisions, instead of having the opportunity to have positive discussions uh, with people um, who really want to have ways of dealing with these issues that don't take lawyers to deal with it and certainly don't take time in courts to deal with it. Thank you. I think I agree that there can't, a legal solution is, is generally going to be the lowest common denominator uh, because, uh, so we do need to have a higher standard than, than that which results in a criminal sanction. Because I think governments need to lead in that. Uh, I mean, we, we can have as, as we can have as many structures as we like to, to at a legal base, which which may result in relationships. I mean, what, what's important in our society, if it's going to function in a positive way, is that people have positive relationships. Now, some of these agreements that have been entered into by mining companies have had some positive elements to them and have created ongoing consultation, ongoing relationships, positive relationships in the Pilbara and places like that. That's, that's, that's the law working in a positive way. Um, but it needs to go beyond just compliance. It needs, there needs to be a, uh, an understanding by those who have impact on society that they need to impact on it as as little as possible in a negative way. Uh, now that will only be reinforced by governments and society telling them that. And we do, it does seem that that's part of what has been happening this year in relation to this Chook and Gorge incident. And I think we need to realize that, grasp it as members of the public uh, and use that power that we have to ensure that people behave ethically uh, in a way which people want them to behave uh, and and that money is not the only pos the only thing that should be driving corporations uh, and i think uh, if people understand that then we might be moving in a direction which does 
respect things, does, does respect things that we all value, such as heritage. We all value heritage. Uh, and it needs to have its proper place in our community. And I think that the question on absolute protection for significant sites is really pertinent. There needs to be public discussions of these being real. There was a great denialism for many decades about site significance being raised at the last minute. This is not true. If you listen to First Nations people, if you look at some of the film productions they've made, like First Footprints, another one being made at the moment, The Inventors, um, and the range of other products by Larissa Berent and Rachel Perkins, these are celebrations of heritage and why it matters. These are profoundly important stories for the traditional owners, for us as joint Australians understanding that this is a received landscape, it's not come as something neutral. And, and I would make a very strong push for deliberate and ongoing support of Indigenous, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people as spokespeople in these celebrations of heritage, contemporary landscapes, historic landscapes, including the, the dark and the very ugly stories of conflict through to those deep time narratives, which as the title of the series, The Inventors Raises, um, sees uh, Aboriginal Australian people, Torres Strait Islanders doing an extraordinary range of things, um, often as world firsts. And this is real, and, and this is something that should be celebrated. So I think, I think our public education policy and curriculum for, for students, uh, our policy frameworks and standards with consultants, but particularly the legislation, should start with the principle of recognising the value of heritage um, to identity and as a right. Matthew, can I just add one thing quickly? The, one of the things which I expect will come out of the Jukun Gorge parliamentary inquiry is the suggestion that there should be national standards for heritage protection. And we, we know that the national legislation has been relatively ineffective. Uh, we need it. I was asked a lot of questions about that by the committee when I gave evidence, and I think uh, it's, it is an appropriate response. It's, it is appropriate to have state-based heritage legislation because most of the heritage is within states and their, and their ex activities with resource companies. But we need to have national standards below which states, state legislation should not descend. Agree. See everyone nodding furiously there. Um, <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. I think we're going to uh, draw a line under that question for the for the evening, and thank everyone for um, for posting your questions. As I said, I've, I have just um, copied and pasted them to another document, so I will send that to our panelists. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank the panel for the thought-provoking observations and insights and their work and the passion that you heard in their voices. Um, uh, that's um, Dr. Virginia Marshall, Professor Peter Veth, and Greg McIntyre, C. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that today's event was hosted by the Law Reform and Social Justice Program. And the LRSJ it has a vibrant community of students working on a range of environmental and social justice projects. So if you're a student um, logging in post exams, today um, and want to get involved, please head over to the LRSJ Facebook site and express your interest. There is an Indigenous Reconciliation Project, for instance. Um, it's been working on truth-telling um, and on treaty-making and will be taking up the issue of protection of Indigenous cultural heritage um, in the new year. Um, we've heard some pretty inspiring as well as sobering things from the panel today. Ultimately, uh, I'm left with, with um, some of Greg's words there about this being a matter of, of connecting, of relationships and of respect. Um, all of our panelists talk about how profoundly important these stories are and um, how important this is as part of our, our received history now. Um, it was a tragic history. Um, let's be part of making it uh, a better future. So thank you everyone for joining today. Maram Bangbalang.